So, we waste too much resource. Uh, this is a, a survey by, by uh, one of my partners, um, uh, Precision Content, in association with the uh, AIM organization, about innovating content creation and reuse, and they say that uh, the Enterprise Business Survey says 87% of businesses duplicate content creation effort, which uh, I am staggered that that's not 100%. I have not met a company who doesn't uh, duplicate content creation effort very badly. Uh, and 80% say that they miss content reuse opportunities. Again, that should be 100%. <laughs> um, from Curata, they did uh, the tactics and tech planner for marketing. So we are getting better, but we're not all getting better together. So the leaders, you can see, where's my laser? Wait, okay, Mr. Foxy there. So they have, uh, they've grouped people into wildebeest, elephants, foxes, etc. and you wanna be a fox is the long and the short of this. So the foxes, the foxy um, wily companies are um, more likely to reuse with a real strategy. So it says there we have specific processes in place to ensure optimal content reuse and repurposing. And the other one is more likely to incorporate reuse tactics consistently. So they are less likely to allow reuse to happen sporadically. It doesn't happen every now and then when one particular team leader or one campaign manager thinks it's a good idea. It's bedded into ongoing process. So what I'm here to talk about today is topical deliverables and evergreen deliverables um, and how we can deal with them. So topical deliverables being related to current events happening out in the world. So you've got um, Brexit or the American election or Christmas coming up or you're about to do a big new launch or a merger. There is some kind of thing happening in the world and you want to attach messaging and content to that. Those are topical deliverables. They go stale fast because once that particular topic isn't as exciting for the audiences, you don't get the engagement, you don't get the traffic, um, and you don't get that value but you have to pay just as much, if not more, for that content to be created than your evergreen de deliverables, which are your kind of ongoing value-add stuff that is your contribution to the market that people are gonna keep coming back to for, for possibly years. What I'm gonna be looking at is the relationship between these two and how, if we organize ourselves properly, we may be able to share supporting information between them. So you will have heard this message a lot about reuse and, and, uh, and getting a bit more intelligent about how we do things. What we've always had a difficulty with in our projects is getting people to actually do that because they need a little bit simpler guidelines. Well, I think we are in, uh, yeah, we're in advanced planning. Um, it's ironic to do this advanced stuff and to plan in this advanced way, I'm gonna clarify these things and hopefully make them a bit more uh, executable for you. So, what is intelligent content? You've heard probably several definitions by day two or three if you went to the workshops. Um, I just want to talk a little bit about a certain mentality thing. What I have noticed about the term intelligent content is even at this event, you get a slightly different take on depending on which person is standing up here at a given time. So what I'm talking about here is taking content and making it the strategic business asset, not the deliverables. So what that means is we still tend to think in how do I get my white paper downloaded or my uh, webinar watched or my leaflet picked up from a stand, et cetera. We're focused and we're judged on those deliverables. People are assigning us, you know, we want a blog per week or we want a white paper per month or something like that. That's kind of how we're treated and that's like how we kind of conceive ourselves. Content is not white papers. White papers are a wrapper for content. That's a, a vehicle with which you package up your content and then ship it out but you can also package it up and ship it out in apps or through third-party channels or through social or through blog posts, et cetera. So when we're talking intelligent content, it's coming back and saying, how do we manage that back end content in its raw form, regardless of the deliverable? Uh, that's one of my more techie terms here, semantically categorized. So when we say uh, white paper or blog post, do you have any idea of what that is other than the shape that it's in. You know it's a white paper, you know it's a blog post. What is in that that is gonna be useful? What does it mean? Is it, you know, is it a tutorial? Is it an application note? Is it telling me how to do a task? Is it explaining a new concept? That kind of thing. 
when we're talking about uh, categorizing our content, we want to categorize it not on deliverable type, but on what you're actually going to get. What is the value of that content in a human sense? Uh, it's, it's a bit stunning to me that there's so many portals that still ask me what format I want my content. I'm looking for an answer. I'm you know, quite open, actually. I'm not going up there and saying, I want a video. It doesn't matter what. Just give me a video. I'm looking for, I'm looking for something that has some particular meaning beyond that. So intelligent content is format agnostic. We don't care what format it's in. And because it's about the content, because it's semantically categorized and format agnostic, it's reusable. And also because we can add all this extra metadata to it, which you've been hearing about, I'm sure, for two days, then it's adaptable. We can, we can do programmatic stuff on it. We can manipulate it with machines um, uh, through automation. Okay, so this is the kind of classic intelligent content diagram pool of modular components, and I can reuse them for different scenarios. I just take out the bits that I want, and like Lego pieces, um, I can build up a battleship or a plane or a boat, whatever I'm, whatever I'm after that particular day. So when we're talking about these components, though, we, we want to have some guidelines for components. What will always fail is telling people, write in reusable components. How, how, how? I've been writing for 10 years, 15 years, I've been working with you, now I want to write reusable components. So we want, need the guidelines, the highest level guidelines. Um, we're trying to write components that answer a single question for the reader. Um, a component has to make sense on its own. So if you're going to reuse it, you have to be able to reuse it without it having sentences like see below or as I said earlier and another thing. Like it has to work as an independent unit. It has to have a specific purpose. Because if you don't have a very clear intent for each component, and that clear intent is not very clear on the title or labeling you've given it in your, in your repository, no one is actually going to reuse it. It may be a great piece of content, but if, if people can't find it in a search result and go, that's what I want, and put it into their content, the reuse will never actually happen. It's only theoretical benefit. Um, so th that is what will allow it to have a descriptive title. And also something I'm going to add, which I don't know if a lot of the people who uh, you've been hearing to have been talking about, is have a specific expected user response. I'm going to talk about what that means and what that adds to component content. We're in the desert. Oh, thank you. Okay. Uh, one other thing about components. Um, I'm going to talk about this more, is that they can be, can be organized into subcomponents. We do have these reusable bits, but if you're getting really sophisticated, and we're going to look at this evergreen versus topical, those bits can also have sub-bits. Uh, blocks and sub-blocks inside the components, it's the same idea. It's just like a component within a component, um, but when you have a subcomponent, maybe it is a bit more in dependent on the stuff around it. So, um, excuse me. So you can reuse it, but you'll have to reuse it in a similar context for it to really work. I have an example here. Um, we have some co content on the left that was kind of traditional content that was written in one way. And we broke it into components. So everything on the left was kind of one flow of information. And what we did was we, we broke that up and we looked at what kinds of things are being said here. So this content, the reason I, I like using it is because it's not going to mean anything to 99% of you. <laughs> it says, um, the procl Proclaim was a multi-center randomized phase three study. The Proclaim study compared treatment with concurrent uh, pemexitred radiation therapy followed by consolidated blah de blah de blah the, That paragraph goes on for one paragraph, and the last sentence of the paragraph is, uh, figure one pr presents a schema of a study design. So what we did is we looked at what is that actually trying to communicate, and we said this, is, this whole thing was uh, an article about a study. And so we took um, a particular component type and we called it study. So not the whole deliverable, but the study bit, which is the summary of what's going on in the study. So they've got, when you're talking about study, you want to know what were the methods used in that study. And so the methods now have a methods title. So that's the methods block within the study component. What's good about that is now I have a much shorter 
explanatory bit before that. And it says, now Proclaim was a, a multi-center randomized phase three study comparing treatment with the drug uh, in patients with and the kind of patients. So if I'm a user, that short description gives me everything I want to know to know whether I want to read on. You may not know exactly what it means, but if you are interested in this area, you know I don't have to read the other half of that really dense paragraph. So I read my very short, short description. Then if I'm interested, okay, then I'm gonna check out the methods. Where are the methods? They're right there, labeled as methods. And then I've got Proclaim was a multi-center randomized phase three study that compared these treatments in sequence. One, two, three. It actually says that in that paragraph. You wouldn't guess it, looking at it, but there, it is actually describing uh, a sequence. So we make that clear and we give that more structure. Not one flow of words, but we structure it out to, it is a sequence, one, two, three, this is the process. And we also say patient characteristics, which is again, part of another sentence in the, in the paragraph. We break it out on its own and we say, the patient characteristics, um, they had unselectable stage three cancer. And then, the, and then again, the figure line is no longer part of the uh, paragraph, it's on its own line. So we've got lots more lines here. So it may seem like we're expanding our content out. You might think that's a bad thing, you wanna keep it short and punchy, but actually by breaking it out into logical bits that have a purpose that is clear and separated, it's easier to read and it's easier to understand. What that also means is it's easier to reuse. So now I can address the patient characteristics I can address the methods, and I can address the title and short description all as separate things because they're each within their own sub-block. So if I'm gonna reuse this and I wanna show just title and, title and short description, or someone uh, wants the title and short description and they wanna click on another screen and expand the methods, but without having to download the whole thing, we can do all that now because we've given that semantic categorization, that meaningful labeling. So that allows us reuse. I want to make a dis distinction between two terms, which again, we're going, be, we're going to be seeing these two terms thrown around a little bit interchangeably, between repurpose and reuse. So we're all here to kind of scale up and, and get more from our content, so we can make different deliverables uh, from the same source. But when we repurpose, we're actually getting into this uh, different model here. We have a pool of modular components and we make deliverable A and we make deliverable B reusing some of the same assets. If they are for one campaign or objective or purpose, we call that purpose A, you haven't done any repurposing yet. You, everything is feeding toward the same purpose. They're all, it's the white paper and the corresponding blog post and a webinar that's about the same topic as the post, aimed at the same people to accomplish the same objective. So it's all aiming at one purpose. Then, if we can actually also create deliverable C for a different campaign, maybe for a different audience with different goals, then we have, we're achieving a new purpose with our content. So if we can do that, we have a whole new thing. We're not just industrializing production, we're creating knowledge and assets in our business which can be leveraged by us or in, by our colleagues in ways they hadn't anticipated. So if campaign A is topical, and campaign B is evergreen, we can start to get more of a balance because we can get people who are on the evergreen team and they, are, you know, they have to get all this topical news and they're getting all this exciting uh, buzzy click traffic coming in, but while they do that, as a side effect, the machine is also spitting out all this evergreen stuff which is gonna help for other purposes. 